here. And those numbers now are gonna start coming in. And we can see those numbers building up here. Guys and girls. Exciting. Tuesday! <laughs> <laughs> the caffeine's just coming through the bloodstream. So pumped and excited today. Because this guy here, you don't realize it, Lutzi. You're one of my favorite people. One of my favorite people. And the reason why is he, uh, there's a great saying, form is temporary, class is permanent. There's so many fading stars that were once good. And then I think to myself, where did he go? Where did she go? But Lutzi just keeps coming along like this race car around the track, around the track. But I've got to hand it to him. He's a smart man because like race cars stop and get pit stops, it allows them to keep going around and around because he's learnt the art of having a long-term sustainable real estate career. Andrew Lutze, one of the owners of Cunningham's, also my co-pilot today, is the CEO, Frank Grief from uh, Real Hub, Real Base. We call them both, but most of you will know them before they became real base they were in fact campaign track and frank is it right that one out of two deals in australasia is touched by you guys you guys are involved in the deal as a stakeholder one in two that's 50 percent of every deal is that right that's right that's right so about two hundred and forty thousand properties came through both real hub and campaign track uh, in the last 12 months so that just below the one and two mark so about 40 45 percent um, of the properties so yes well so, i've got to say after realestate.com and domain mate there would not be a supplier that has got their fingerprints on those um deals and um Lutzi, who is a campaign track client, I, I know that for a long term because of their ads that they used to have in uh, the Manly uh, Daily. Out of curiosity, Andrew, do you do you still use print ads? I, I mean, I, I'm not close to it anymore. Do you still use print? Yeah, I think a lot of people have taken a notion that print's a bit of a dying breed, and and you know, sadly it, it is. But um, I still get quite a lot of attraction from doing in print, and just when you think it's died or it's dead. Uh, a lot of people have exited it. So there's almost like a platform for you to own that space. So I've only recently gone heavily back into it. Um, okay. And and I think I probably will. I think I might even double down on that because I think a lot of people still read the paper, you know, yeah. and as much as everything's at your fingertips on digital spaces and social platforms, yeah, there's something nice about holding onto a paper and something nice about people reading the paper. And yes, there's always going to be distribution problems and is he really getting value for money? Um, but I think, yeah, the paper is probably a, a good signature of, of your success in the market as well. Some people who are uneducated to the market still value, you know, how, how well you're doing based on how many ads you've got in the paper. And um, yeah, yeah, well, we'd I mean, love to change that. It just, that's still some of the perceptions. Yeah. yeah well, the, the, I mean, the interesting, the inter you know, I had to, one person said to me, Tom, I see the newspaper as being the uh, NRL ladder, right? Um, I just basically see a ladder comes out each week and it says who's first, who's second, who's third, right? Because the average vendor out there in your community does not look at your whiteboard in your office to know how much stock you've got, right? They don't sit there. They just, you know. But, you know, Andrew Lutze, Frank, for the record, Andrew Lutze has been, in my real estate gym, has been one of the biggest contributors. He, I've gone back to him time and time again from the first time when he came into a uh, Holt Street in Surrey Hills. I still remember you were the coach of, uh, you were the rugby coach of your uh, of a team <laughs> in the area. I remember. Right. Um, yep. Now I've got to tell you, back then uh, Lutzi was riding around one and a half, two million dollars. Now I'm pleased to let you know, gang, the guy that you're looking there on that screen there is on track to do 4.5 million in GCI. 4.5 million GCI, a regular in the REB top 100 and up at that pointy end. Also one of the partners of Cunningham's, an independent boutique office in uh, the Northern uh, Beaches. Um, and uh, Lutzi, thank you for taking time out during um, during lockdown. You coping okay with lockdown? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, it's, fortunately it's, it's not our first rodeo. A lot of people have been through this and I know there's a lot of people out there doing a lot harder than what we are. 
um, across Sydney and, and, and other spots. But no, we're still going okay and just trying to be as practical and pragmatic about it as you can be. You know, nothing lasts forever and you just got to you know, get on with it. Like most, of the most, like most speed bumps in the road, you know, you just, there's no point pissing and moaning about it. You may as well just get on with it. Let's make the most of it and, and, and have a good time. So that's the way I take it. And, and no, I'm pretty good. I mean, apart from homeschooling, which is, you know, killing me, but it's all right. <laughs> but again, can't change it. So I may as well focus on stuff I can change. Yeah, I can't get over. Yesterday I went for a walk with my uh, youngest daughter and um, um, I said to her, how are you coping with um, homeschooling? And she said, you know, like it's, um, it's pretty good. I said, tell me what you like about it. She goes, oh, well, for a start, we get a 20 minute break before every class now. So instead, <laughs> before, you know, so you get 20 minute break and I go, what do you do? She says, oh, well, 20 minutes, they tell you to get up and walk around. And um, so she goes, so every period, 20 minutes, and then I go, what else do you like about, you know, homeschooling? She goes, well, I've got my mobile phone on my lap most of the time. And, um, you know, I just stare into the Zoom and I've got my mobile phone on my lap. And um, that seems to work out pretty good. I get a one hour recess. I get a one hour and 10 minutes. So actually, actually she said it, one hour and 11 minute lunch. <laughs> and um, she goes, I'm sleeping in. I don't have to wake up early to get, you know, transport. And um, she goes, so, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy to, uh, to keep going as it is. I'll keep my, uh, she, she goes, I keep my eye on the cases each day. I look at the press conference. She goes, so I know when I've got to get back to school. But she didn't sound like she was so looking forward to it. But uh, I just want to, you know, your listing presentations and, you know, you, you, you do use digital pre-list kits. You do use a, um, the auction method. Am I right? Are you an auction-based agent? Yeah, I mean, predominantly, you know, I'd say we start off almost 80% of our campaigns as auction and how many make it to the day just depends. You know, but I'd say blended average 50% um, make it to auction day. And and that's not by by um, any sort of uh, favoritism, whether we like selling prior or not. It just comes down to the mechanics of the campaign and what's working. You know, oh, what well, so, 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 so Lutzi, are you telling me, but what percentage of properties that you list actually start off as an auction campaign? Over 80%. Over 80%. Yeah. Okay. So you are, you're, you're one that is more than happy and it appears that half those properties are going to get sold before the auction day. Yeah. Again, and, and there's no rhyme or reason around that. It usually just depends on how the campaign unfolds. If it looks like we've got a couple of personalities, buyers that are, uh, leaning towards and we know we'll get a better price from them face to face then we'll 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 pull the trigger early equally if we've got lots of buyers that are all at the same level then we'll run it through to auction you know and and you know being an auctioneer i love going to auction it's it's one of the best parts and it's also a great profile build but it's also um uh you know you you, you really can maximize the campaign as well in terms of getting the most out of it not only for the vendor but for yourself so there's there's a lot of benefits of going all the way through to auction but uh, you know, like most things, you've got to be able to adapt and change depending on, you know, when one day you might have three buyers, the next day, very quickly, you know, you've got one. You know, so how you've got to move. Let's see, how do you use you being the auctioneer at a listing presentation to your advantage? And is it an advantage? Well, <laughs> like, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of agents watching this um, webinar that I want to say that it's a, definitely a disadvantage, <laughs> you know, because I can't work the floor and all those sort of things as well. So I know all the all the rhetoric that comes out from my competitors, but I, look, I, I see it as an advantage because I've got four weeks to build rapport with the buyers, four weeks to understand exactly their personality types. And but unlike most other independent auctioneers who are very good, by the way, but, you know, they do get paid regardless of the result. So there's not really a lot of invested interest in that. And uh, and sometimes it's just, you know, having a bit of humanization around that with the owner for them to understand what sort of value I really do add being not only the agent, but also the auctioneer and how how much the quality of the conversation is going to be different with me than it will be with an agent and an independent auctioneer. And yes, there is value in the third voice. And look, sometimes I still do use independent auctioneers, you know, Clarence Wright and Cooley's and all those guys, but they're all very good at auctioneers and there's huge merit in using them if you're not your own agent auctioneer. But for Cunningham's, we've got in-house auctioneers as well as external ones and we use both. It just, again, depends on what role I want to play in the campaign. Some owners say, Andrew, I just want you to be the agent. Actually, I'd prefer to have an independent auctioneer. And that's fine. 
Um, and other times they say, no, most of the time people come call me initially for exactly that reason. They go, Andrew, I saw you do that auction. You know, or they, or sometimes they were drunk at a charity event. They go, I saw you doing that thing and I might have chastised them because they didn't pay too much on the, on the charity floor. <laughs> you know, I might have had a few drinks as well. But it, it's funny how people remember certain things in their life and then they come back to you for those reasons as well if you did a good job. So I know that's not the answer you're probably looking for. There's no hard and fast answer. No, but I mean, contrary to a lot of people, I mean, I... I can't get over the amount of auctioneers who have sent me messages in the past when they've heard me say it on videos. I believe that real estate agents should do their auctions. I and and they and and and, and because I do auctions, I mean auctions are a small part of my life. You know, you'd be a great I, agent, Tom. You know, you could be the auctioneer and the agent. And yes. thought about getting into real estate. <laughs> yeah, I, yes, correct. But I mean, <laughs> Lutzi, you think about it. I mean. Firstly, number one, you're 100% right, and that is the auctioneer is going to pick up their six, 700 bucks regardless of the result. That's one thing, right? Though I have to say to you, um, I think I actually, my, myself, I wouldn't do anything differently, right? I still like okay. to think I, I wouldn't do anything differently myself. The second thing is, but I just believe that when you actually have listed the product, when you work that core market, man, Having self-belief in the product is one of the most important things in sales. I find that if you believe in something badly, it doesn't matter what you're selling, right? It could be an Apple product. It could be, you know, a car. If you deeply have a conviction in your product, and that's why I think more agents should actually do it because it's their energy that's going to come out in a conversation. And the other thing is frequency that builds trust can be done between the listing agent who's an auctioneer and the bidders on the day. I mean, these yeah. auctioneers that show up don't have the benefit of this frequency trust, you know? I just find, guys, I just, and I know we're going off topic here, but I think it's a useful information. I, I find where I have an advantage as an auctioneer in an auction is that sometimes I think the agent has become emotionally involved with the vendor. And what happens is they don't have that crucial conversation in that split 20 seconds, right? Mm. Right, you know, whereas sometimes I come in, like for instance, you know, on the weekend I did a Zoom auction and we were about $50,000 short. And then I sort of got the vendors aside on my phone and I said, um, and, and, and I could hear the, the, the agent, right? We were on a three-way phone call. The agent was sort of nervous about it. And I said, hey, guys, the good news is we now know what your home's worth. Yeah. There was just yeah. silence, right? Right? And uh, he said to me afterwards on the phone, he goes, I could never have said that. I could never yeah. have said that. You could say that. He goes, I just was there from day one. I could never have said it. But I'm curious, when you get a call to do a listing presentation, Describe, Lutzi, what happens when you get the call? What does the pre-list look like for you, including the phone conversation and what preparation you do? Do you send anything out to them before you go to the house? Yeah, I think um, there's so much training that goes on from yourself. Like the real estate gym, you know, phenomenal stuff as well. And depending on where you are in your real estate career, a lot of the stuff does become... Um, a bit autonomous as well. And you there's a certain touch points that you should be doing regardless, whether you're in the first year of real estate or whether you're in your 20th year, you know, there's still valuable points. And it's only, it's ironic because once you pull one little element out of that, you, you start to analyze why you didn't win the listing and what was it. And, and the owner will say it's a flip of a coin, but I found more often than not, it is those little inches. It's those tiny little things that all add up that, that, that together gave the owner confidence in someone else rather than you. So for me, um, usually if I get an appraisal call rather than me proactively chasing one down, let's say that written a phone call comes in, almost always I'll say, can I call you back? Um, and the reason for that is I don't want to be off guard. I don't really want to take a phone call and have an in-depth conversation with someone when I don't have all the information. So I'll get some quick details from them, name, number, and so on. Had, you know, call me, look, I'll just say, look, I'm just with someone at the moment. You know, do you mind if I call you back shortly? And if I know it's going to take me 20 minutes or 30 minutes, so look, do you mind if I call you back in 30 to 40 minutes? And that way, then I can quickly jump on the computer, research and see if they're already in our database. I'll look on their social media, 
you know, Google their name and that sort of thing, just to find out a bit of background about them as well. Look up where their property is and do some quick research on the property before I have that initial appraisal conversation over the phone to book in the appraisal. I heard um, Will Phillips once when I did a training session actually at Bressett Whitney many years ago um, when he was working in real estate. He coined a phrase, which I'm sure he you know, ripped off from someone else, but said the listing's won before you even get in the front door. And I firmly believe that. I think I said that at Eric this year. And I, I think there's so much relevance around, yes, you need to have good sales skills and good presentation skills when you're at the listing, but everyone's going to have that. When you get to a certain caliber, there's skill that, there's a, the skill level that the agent's going to have is probably going to be universal. And I think that's really where the deeper connection, the ability to be liked, someone who really trusts you, like you said before, know you like, you trust you, frequency builds trust. Those things come out if you start building rapport and you really have a normal and honest connection with someone. And these are easy things to say over webinar now. And how do you actually do that? How's the practical elements of that come together? Well, it starts off by you having good knowledge because ultimately no one's going to trust someone if they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, so excuse the French, but you know, we must, we're getting into it, right? Um, and the, the second thing is that if I come on that phone call prepared and I know where their property is and I know some of the recent sales, in that conversation being candid, I can reference some of these other sales initially. And ultimately you'll find that that first phone call, I know if I haven't spent at least 10 to 20 minutes on that phone call with someone, then I probably haven't done enough digging and asked the right questions to get more of a rapport with that person for them to really think, you know what, that agent, rather than just taking down the notes mm -hmm. and booking in the time, he left a bit more of a memorable impression with me. And that for me is sort of being the, the difference between just taking the appraisal call, booking it in, and then trying to build rapport when I'm at the property as opposed to actually already being on the front foot when I get there. So back in the day, I remember we used to do these, um, these pre-listing, you know, everyone gives out a pre-listing kit, right? You get the phone call, you do the pre-listing kit same day and so on. You do a confirmation email with your profile and all that. These are all basic things that everyone probably does. And there's loads of training out there for all that stuff. But uh, we went through this phase and I think Real Hub actually designed it for us where we had these video books and you'd open up the video book and there would be a video of me and I'd do this recording saying, oh, hi, G'day, Tom, it's Andrew from Cunningham's here. Really looking forward to seeing you at your property Tuesday at 12 o'clock. You know, um, in the meantime, here's a bit more information about me, my team and the company. Look forward to seeing you soon. And it was this little gadget, right? And, and it's died now because it's, it's kind of, we've progressed on from that. It's a digital world. So, um, but that single bit of rapport that came from that pre-recorded message on that video book that was delivered to their door, the amount of time people came and said to me when I got there, oh, I feel like I already know you. Or they, they start having some sort of connection or rapport. And, and Frank, you would have seen all these different ideas in your space as well. God, every day you get some sort of new tech bit of um, you know, jazz that comes along. But ultimately, that's just the precursor for me having an honest, real conversation with someone that I feel like I can really help them. And yes, my negotiation skills, my fees, my marketing, my strategy, that's all going to be really important when we get into the crux of it. But there's no point in me talking about any of that stuff unless I've got a genuine connection with someone. That's awesome. Can I, can I ask a question? Um, firstly, that's so interesting, uh, your idea about calling them back. Tom, that's the first time we've ever heard that. I think most uh, most people's like excited. Oh, let me quickly close this thing I, down. But, so but Frank, think about it. How often is a real estate agent just sitting at their desk doing nothing, having, <laughs> their, brain on, having their brain on pause, ready just to take a random call where they've got to actually create a connection. Mm -hmm. Generally, they're flustered. Yeah. Generally, they're heading somewhere. Generally, they've been on a phone or now on, on a Zoom. Generally, they're discussing something with a team member. And he's so right there. So you good. want to start, like, I often reckon the start of your relationship dictates how that relationship's going to look like. Because people, whether you like it or not, they do make a decision on you very quickly, you know, the first few seconds. Yeah. Don't you agree that, Lutzi? Don't you agree? Oh, yeah. It's, you can change your mind afterwards about someone, but why? It's not easy because I reckon once someone forms an opinion, they get off, oh, shit, that was a bit weird, wasn't it, you know? And they don't realise yeah. that you're running for a listing presentation late and you're flustered. Yeah, and it's very, and look, you might be the give the best pitch in the world, and you probably were the best agent at the listing appointment. But because the other agent did a great job 
in the in the pre-list section, they might have had already had that gut feeling. Mm-hmm. You know, and so many times, you know, they can't explain why, or yes, you might have lost it for one or two percentage points here or there, or the marketing was a bit cheaper. Sure, but that's the byproduct of the fact that they just felt better with the other agent. And I've been on the receipt, I've been the recipient of many of those phone calls. You know, as much as I've had great success in my career, I've still lost. Jesus, I've lost loads of listings, you know, and and um and and it never gets any easier. But the ability to move on from those losses really quickly is probably where you have better success and what you try and learn from it. Now you're not going to learn everything every time and go, oh, this is amazing. I now know exactly what to do and I'm going to do it perfect this time. You try your best and then you move on. You know, but um, you're you're absolutely right. People form those opinions unfairly because it's it's you know when you haven't even met them. Yeah. So you, you want to try and give yourself the best advantage you can. How can I be a front runner? How can I make sure that they're going to say, you know, I had a, I had a really good connection with Andrew. Geez, he said, this guy sounds like he knows his shit. You know, that's that for me is kind of the pinnacle. And I know if I haven't had enough of them talking back to me on the phone call, or if I haven't had, asked the right questions, or I'm getting yes, no, yes, you yeah. know, very stagnant answers, then I haven't really got a connection. And you might deal with some dickhead owners who are like that, and that's just their personality type. You know, but to be honest, most of the time, these difficult vendors are going to be like that as well. Even if you do win the listing, you know, they're still going to refer you to other dickhead people as well. So, 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 so Frank, I I did interrupt you and I'm going to come back to you. I just want to ask this question because it's fresh in my mind. You know, that that person, that yes, no person, that person that just is not making any effort to build rapport, right? I mean, the good thing, Lutzi, is that chances are they're doing that to every agent anyway, right? Right? That's a good. But I'm curious, how do you, with people like that, what do you, how do you adjust? Do, do, do you also sort of tone it back? Well, you can't ask direct questions. You have to ask open, what they call open questions. So, Tom, tell me, look, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? And you be the, we'll do a quick role play. You be the, you sure. be the, the, the dickhead and I'll be the owner. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be good at that. <laughs> I'm joking, man. I'm joking. Okay. Um, so, look, thanks for calling, Tom. Um, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Sure. Okay, excellent. Do you mind just telling me a bit more about your home? Is it a three, four, or five-bedroom home? Five-bedroom home. I'll pause it right there. I'll pause it right So that's, that's what I would say is an open question. So if I've had some rapport beforehand and I'm going through this and I'm getting yes, no, yes, no, yeah, then I'd ask an open question like that where they have to describe their home to me. Mm. And then when you pick up a detail on that, and you say, yeah, I've got a, a two lounge rooms, I've got upstairs and I've got a pool at the back. Oh, great. Do you mind if I just quickly delve into the pool, Tom? Is it a concrete pool or a fiberglass pool? Love it. Because even the dickhead loves his house. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> And then, guys, girls, so you don't freak out, we're, we're saying that in a very joking way. We're just talking yeah, yeah. about there are some vendors, man, you'd love to have a beer with them. They become mates. And there are other vendors the whole time it was cold, transaction, transactional, right? But you're mm-hmm. so right because I reckon even if they don't like you and don't like agents, let's assume the story is they just don't like agents. And there's plenty of people that fit in that category, right? So, but people do love sort of talking about their home. So I reckon that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, and look, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm just being tongue in cheek here when I say that because most most clients, 95% of them are nice people and they're just the same as you. They want to relate. And ultimately, you're, we're in the service-based industry. So we're there to try and help them. We're there to serve. Now, we need to be competitive. You know? So I guess what we're talking about now is how can I be more competitive at the table? And, and for me, it starts before I even get to the table. You know? So I think that's the, the key. What are those questions? So obviously we're talking about those key questions that you would do prior. What are the key fundamental questions that you would say on the phone to, to help to help shape that appointment when you're in the living room? Yeah, sure, Frank. And I think a lot of them, apart from the obvious, which is you're getting down the correct details, so full name as well, you know, their, their contact details, email addresses as well, is the property. And I always ask, you know, it's good to know, who the decision makers are. So always, you know, I always ask a very subtle question around that. Look, is the property in a company name or is it actually just in your personal name or yourself and a partner or a husband or wife, yeah. you know, and they go, okay. And what are those full names? Just so I don't make any assumptions. Yeah, that's good. So yeah. It's really important to get those particulars because how many times we assume we heard a name and we don't want to be rude and say, okay, is it, 
is it grief or is it graf or is it you know like is that one f or two f's yep so just really making sure you dive down on that first and i usually get those particulars out of the way at the start of the phone call yeah. and then i'll then move into okay great now have you been and a good another opening question as well have you been keeping an eye on the marketplace you know, are you are you familiar with what's going on in the market? It's another way to phrase it. You know, have you seen any recent sales in your area that you think might be relevant to your home? And this is all stuff that you probably ask at the listing appointment anyway, or the or appraisal. But if you can have that up front, then when you ask it again, it's not going to seem alien to them. We're going to have follow on from that conversation. Yeah. Um, so you know, asking those sort of questions as well. Okay, excellent, because that one went for two point six million, and that had the pool, and yours, you know, sounds like yours doesn't. So do you mind just telling me a bit more? Would you mind if you can just describe for me a bit more about your home? You know, and they go, you know, is it a three, four, or five bedroom? They go through that. And go, okay, great. And in terms of the kitchens and bathrooms, have you done any recent upgrades in those areas in the last five or ten years? Yeah. And they'll they'll jump into that. Okay, great. And any major extensions or additions to the house? You know, and then I'll go through literally some of the other hit points. You know, a buyer's going to want to know what's the parking like? What's the topography of the land? Is it level at the back? Is there any retaining walls that are uh, situated on the property? You know, um, you can ask some of these. The more detail you can get into. Now, this is all well and good if you've got someone who wants to talk. Awesome, 80% of people. But surely enough, you're going to get people that are quite abrupt and they say, this is, oh, what's with the questions? It's interrogation. It's too much. And I think that's the skill of the agent to really understand when you get, when you're taking down those particulars at the start of the conversation, before you dove into description, you need to ascertain whether you're going to match and mirror this person. They're going to be quite abrupt. And I'm only going to ask two or three questions. And if I'm still not getting good answers from those open questions, I'll just do a reconfirmation and yep. then I'll leave it. Yep. Because if I, if I, it's a fine line between obviously building rapport with someone and then being a pest. Yeah, that makes sense. And, yeah. and, and with, with those, um, those questions are you, are you pre-framing it with the vendor saying look the, you know I'm, I'm doing this because i want to make sure i get as much detail about your home or not really you're just diving straight into the questions no so that's always and do you mind just before we move forward and before um we lock in that appointment do you mind if i ask a quick couple of questions frank um just so i can give you the best advice possible yeah sure you know you go through that okay and then i'll and then if i get good answers back and they're willing to talk then i'll keep going with it yeah. if i don't they go yeah yeah okay sure what do you want to know you know, then then you might you might just be a bit more subtle with that as well. Um, and then when I'm closing, I always just say, look, no problem. Well, look, that's really great. That gives me a lot. Of, you know, I'll go and do some research just so we can make best use of our time together when we do catch up. You know, so so just want to make let them know that the reason why you ask those questions is you're going to do a lot of research before we catch up, just so we can make you know best use of our time when we do see each other. Yeah, cool, awesome. Yeah. And then what? Sorry, you go for it. Go for it. I was just going to say, and then I was going to say next steps now. So after that phone call, is there anything you're doing um, these days, a, a text, an email, or anything that there's another touch point before the meeting or you're, you're kind of all set now prior to your meeting? Uh, well, just the confirmation email, obviously, which, which most people would do, just giving them your details as well um, yep. and any other sales history that might be relevant for their property. Um, I'll then do, which usually involves, you know, your digital pre-list and all that sort of stuff now. Yep. Um a confirmation, a call the morning of or the day before is always yep. good. But apart from that, no. Um, I think depending on how far out the appraisal is, yes. if it's two or three weeks away and there's a good sale before then, I'll usually call through or text through something with that result. Yeah, I think that's important depending on whether they're a now seller or whether it's a pipeline one, two years away. We yeah. just want to price update Andrew or something like that. But ironically, a lot of those people, especially in COVID and lockdown now, those one or two years away, end up being, you know, a database seller now, you know, mm -hmm. and they, and you can always say, well, suppose I had a buyer that's prepared to pay a premium. Would you, would you be happy for me to get them through? You know, and half the time the conversation starts at that little seed of opportunity mm -hmm. and then it grows into something bigger. And next thing you know, you've got a full blown auction campaign. So um, because the motivation changes that when the buyer, when an owner gets a buyer through that's qualified and you're not wasting their time, certainly you don't want to waste your own time. So you're only going to do it if it's, if it's, if it's, if you do have someone genuine, but, um, you just never know where those those um, conversations can go with someone who is not really a now seller. You know, they might and, be. In and I would say to everyone that's watching this right now, this has to be the first time in my real estate life, which is 34 and a half years, where often vendors will say, do you reckon it's worth that much? There are vendors there that have underestimated 
the growth of what's happened in the market. It's, you know, um, so I actually think what you basically said, Lutz, is very true. And that is don't make the assumption that if they're in agent box or your CRM system and you thought that they were selling in 2023, there's a thing called COVID clarity. Mm. COVID has changed the speed of people making decisions. I mean, think about it. We change flights and weddings and events in one finger these days. We've learned that, you know, nothing is set in stone, right? We simply know that tomorrow we could be working. On Friday, we could be sitting in our home. And I think COVID clarity has taught people, hey, you know what? I want to sort of go out and live in Byron or I want to sort of go out and buy a farm, you know, in, uh, you know, Orange. Orange wouldn't be a great one to go in the past. Right? <laughs> Musselbrook or somewhere. <laughs> Musselbrook. Go to Musselbrook. It's all clear there. Sorry, everybody right? from Orange on the door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm getting at, what I'm getting at, Lutzi, is that you are right. You can't make these assumptions. But what I was going to ask you is, you know, when you're at, you know, when you go to that listing presentation, do you, do you try and get price? Have you got a night? At what point does price come into it? Is it on the phone or is it the first time you touch the subject is at the listing? Um, I know a lot of agents feel differently about this. Um, and it's a bit of a controversial question, but I, I almost always try and get price out of them on the phone. What are their expectations on price? You know, have you seen any recent sales that you think are relevant for your home? And, how, and then how do you think your place compares to them after they answer? You know, so, okay, well, typically homes of what you described range between 2.5 to 2.75. Where do you think you probably sit on that one? Is it at the upper end or the lower end? So I've got a pretty good understanding. Or is it, and then you can just, ask, if you really got a good rapport, you can just be bold enough. So, so is there a certain Christmas, Christmas wish price you had in mind that you guys wanted to achieve for the sale? Okay. You know, and, and most of the time, if you ask something that direct, you know, people will just tell you, you know, um, and or they'll say, well, that's what I've got you for, Andrew. Yeah. And I say, no problem. Look, it's not going to change my opinion of value. You know, and I'm going to do a hell of a lot of research and we can arrive at the same price together. But sometimes people say to me, Andrew, unless I get this number, I can't make the move. And I just want to know, is this one of those conversations? Lutzi, do you ever, do you ever get called out to a listing presentation and you can feel... I'm being called out here, but I can tell that they want an opinion of me. They want a view, but I think in their mind, they've picked someone that they want to go with. <laughs> All the time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it sucks, but it's a bit like, well, what do you do? You know, it's part of the game. You know, it's, it's part of the job. And how, do you, yeah, how, gonna... how do you handle that? Do you, do you bring that up to the surface at all? Or how do you ever hand, how, how do you handle it? Or, or do you just tell, man, that's, that's life, that's the process? Well, it, look, it, it, unfortunately, you can, you, you can get really upset about these sort of things and whether you're getting price checked or not. And you really know after your first five or 10 minutes whether you've got a rapport with these people or they just want to show you around and they just they don't really... Yeah, they just want to get that figure and then they, you know, and then they want to move on sort of thing. So, you know, you can, you can be a bit of an asshole and just put an extra million dollars on top and say, yeah, that's what I'll get for you just to stuff it up for the other agent or, um, and then they go, great, we'll choose you. <laughs> um, <laughs> or, or you can, um, or, or, but look, most of the time I'd say, look, I appreciate obviously, you know, if I really, if I really feel that it's, it's that, you know, apparent that actually you know we just don't want to rush through it i say listen i appreciate obviously you, you're probably having stuff in your letterbox every single day from agents you know um saying they've got buyers they've got prices and so on can i just be upfront and say you know, do you have any allegiances to anyone else now are there any other agents that you're working with at the moment or have been over the past six 12 months and usually from that conversation you know, you'll get a pretty honest response. No, look, you're the first person we've called in. Or we've, yeah, we've spoken to a couple of other agencies. Great. Well, look, I fully appreciate, you know, I would love to work with you. But, you know, ultimately, I don't want to waste your time or my time. You know, if there was a certain figure we could agree on in terms of marketing and commission structure, are you happy to work with Cunningham's and myself? You know, and that's a very gets a very quick closer, but it gives you an understanding as to whether you're going to waste your time for the next 40 minutes pitching on it or whether actually, you know, we're going to cut to the chase. I'm happy to give you my opinion on value, you know, but I just wanted to know, you know if, if there was something or do you already have sort of a leaning towards another agency? What does it, you know, when you sit down at the dining room table, um, Andrew, can you describe what do you show and what are you talking about? Like, 
are you an iPad type presenter? What are you showing in that business conversation? Um, I, th I think there's a lot of merit in the iPads and some of the guys who are really good with tech in my office do it very well. Um, you know, Matt Nicastri is a, is, a, is a very good agent who, who uses the iPad religiously to go through comparable sales and pull up aerial images and stuff like that, which is really good because if there's no delay in that tech, that's when you still have got the owner in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I find for me, I, almost, I always use paper. So I, I use comparable sales, you know, RP data and your price finder and, and I use real estate to com domain and, and pull up what's sold, what's, what's listed, pull up all of our Cunningham's brochures as well, like properties have got floor plans. So I can really lay it out on the table and say, you know, these are all the, the different, you know, comparable sales. You know, you know, how, what do you think of these? And let's talk about them. And we workshop each different property and we go through the sales um, stories of each property as well to see how they're relevant for their home. Now, don't get me wrong, every listing appointment, I know I'm jumping around here, but every listing appointment has to have somewhat of an agenda, you know, and we know that that agenda will always get covered off, you know, timing, pricing, strategy, you know, buyers, you're talking about your marketing, your fee structure, the logistics, how's it all going to come together, and ultimately your conviction itself, you know, to, to get it listed. So those things are, are, are very important. And I, for many years of my career, I used to have that fixed agenda that I worked through. I think as I've, as I've matured into my career, I've shifted the order in which that happens. And it's more for me about the connection with the person rather than the way the agenda is going to flow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, before I was a bit too rigid about how I wanted that, you know, I wanted to be in control. Now I used to let a bit of um, rope out and let the owner have a bit more control of that, but I'd always bring it back to my agenda. And now I'm, I'm far more fluid in that. And I let that the, um, the conversation is probably the most important part. And if that's not going easily, um, then, I, then I'm not going to get any connection. There's no point talking about what I want to talk about. That's got nothing to do with me. It's got everything to do with them. So I really want to focus more on what they, what they want and what they need. Um, but subtly we'll always touch off all of those parts on the agenda. We'll still get to pricing. We'll still get to timing. We'll still talk about fees. These are, these are Frank, to me, these are the qualities of um, the, the elite, the super champions, right? It's yeah. very, very difficult to train that. And for people that are watching this, I've got to let you know, if you're at chapter three of your career and you've just heard what Lutzi said, who's on chapter 10, you might end up having a client that you know, starts taking the conversation in a direction and then you hear, hey, you know, let it be fluid. And what happens is it goes round and rounds in circles and it doesn't come to B. It starts at A, but doesn't come to B. B is actually, hey, uh, when can I start for work? Lutzi's got the ability to let that conversation be fluid so it feels authentic, but his timing of saying something will actually move the conversation back to it. Very hard to train that. Very hard to train that. And I think, it, you know, Lutz, I reckon part of it is EQ, but part of it is 5,000 listing presentations. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I, I, I totally agree, Tom. And if I was in my first five years of real estate, um, I'd still be following the agenda. You know, I think you've really got it. That's that, um, you know, there's a few different things that I, uh, I talked about at Eric this year, which was around the, the product knowledge first, you know, especially in your first three, five years, is having absolute certainty around your product knowledge. And then your skill level, your ability to, to, to negotiate, to list, to pitch, to close, all of those things. Now, And when they start to converge together and you've got this nice marriage coming together and you've really, like you said, you've nailed, you've got enough sweat equity in the amount of listing appointments you've done you know, to now have that experience where you can start to change and evolve and adapt that. But I found that when I started pulling one or two of those things out and going fluid, going rogue, if you like, um, I'd miss some part of that listing presentation that I needed to talk about. And I'd miss one part of the agenda. And that might have been the critical part that would have won me the listing. It might have been why Cunningham's, why me? What's my unique selling position? You know, and you don't come out with it. Oh, so we've talked about timing. We've talked about you know, structure, we talked about, you know, the, the fees and that. Excellent. Okay. Uh, oh, wait, I've now got to mention, you know, why do you want to list with Andrew Lutz and Cunningham's? You know, it's like you've, you've got to read that play. And a lot of time, 
a lot of those subtleties will come out in your conversations. Mm -hmm. Not so much a monologue, but it'll actually be more of a conversation about where you can sprinkle in, why would you list with Andrew Lutzi? And that usually gets wrapped around a case study. Yeah. Yeah? And I think there, there's some real, really good things yeah. that I've learned from other agents. I'm going to ask you two questions and I'm going to hand over to Frank. Um, and uh, the first question is, and happy for you to role play this, you being the agent, me being the vendor, let's assume that, you know, everything's going absolutely right. And you can sense that this guy's going with me, but now I just bring up the, you know, just bring up the fee, right? I just want to role play this with you. <laughs> okay. I'm you I'll, I'll be, I'll be the normal vendor. I'll be a normal vendor, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's all right. So, Andrew, that's all good. Uh, mate, what's the fee? Well, look, there's a lot of different ways you can pay fee structures, Tom. Um, and for most people, traditionally, they work on flat rate structures. But more commonly in the last decade, people have been working on incentive-based programs as well and ranges as well. Do you have a, a fee in mind that you wanted to work or a type of structure that would appeal to you? Yeah, I mean, I just, I don't know. I just don't want to pay, you know, uh, more than I have to. Um, sure. It's a $3 million property. I don't know. Like, you know, I was thinking... Um, what people charge somewhere between one and two percent isn't it thereabouts yeah look it, again it all depends on the structure you know um, most agents nowadays will charge anywhere you know as low as 1.6 percent and up to three percent there's a lot of agents i compete with that still charge three percent or more so um look one and i put together a few different uh, options for you um and i appreciate obviously you don't want to pay any more than you have to but equally i think it's probably instead of the fee being an expense for your services, I think you, you probably agree with me that it's more around what goes in your back pocket that counts. You know, so, so this is, I think, probably the best, best investment you can make is actually in the agent and their ability to, to get you that best price. So um, there's merit in all the different structures you look at. So I might pause it there because we, we, we really go into the, to the full detail. That's when I'd actually jump into, okay, this is what a fixed fee looks like. This is what ranges looks like. This is what incentive looks like. This is what discretionary fees look like. Uh, there's so many different types. And usually that conversation, and the reason I'm being a little bit evasive is that based on your personality type, yeah. there'll be a leaning towards something I'll, I would suggest. If you're clearly you know, um, hypersensitive and logical, you might want something that's more spreadsheet based as well, because that's going to feed into your personality. If you're a no nonsense, just give me the fucking fee you know, I'll just go, this is the flat rate, you know, and, and, you know, normally I would charge this given the amount of depth in the market I've got here, you know, we might be able to look at some sort of, if I get this fee, then we charge this. So it's, it is negotiable, you know, and I think anyone who says, I'd love to say, yeah, well, I stick to, you know, 2.2% fees and all that, Dick Slider, you know, he's brilliant. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the reality is I know every agent out there, you know, you have to negotiate your fees because it's so competitive. But ultimately, there's going to be a breaking point for anyone where it's just not worthwhile you working on this listing, especially if someone just hammers you that hard on your fees. You kind of got an opening. It's a window as to their personality type, what they're going to be like dealing with the whole campaign. And I know the allure of when you've got no listings is that you'll probably overlook these things. And you'll go with it. And you'll sign them up anyway, despite your better judgment. And it's only until you've been burnt, you know, 10 or 20 times throughout your career, you know, over five, 10 years that you'll then start to go, Jesus, is it really worth it? You know, maybe I'm better off just shutting the door and sticking with my values and actually working on something that's better where they go, you know what? Easy decision to choose, Lutzi. You know, he was a good guy, a good agent, and I'm always going to run with you because I trust you, you know, and they'll refer you to better people anyway. So the fee conversation, whilst it's super important now, and it is, there's no way of getting around it. This will always be a great topical conversation or workshop. But the better you can workshop on your, on, your, on your mates, your colleagues in the office around, you know, why is your fee what it is? Whether it's 1%, 2%, 3%, it doesn't matter. If you've actually, like you said before, Tom, there's a belief transfer. Fee doesn't become an issue when you know your product that well. And ultimately, when you're selling fee, you're selling yourself. Mm. So if you've got that belief transfer, it'll come across naturally and go, you know what, I'm, I'm worth every, every cent of 3%, 2%, 1%, whatever. I'm worth every penny of it, you know, and these are the reasons why, you know, and you've got full conviction. There's no hesitation in that. That's I right. love it. I love it. And I also love, I love the ability, Frank, there of, you know what I like about this guy? Because he is legit. You know how many times, Frank, I interview people and, you know, like I had one, he never came up with a bed. He said to me, Tom, 
I have never, never dropped my feed. And I said to him, well, I, said, I said, I can go to realestate.com, right? And I can actually pull up every property that you've sold. I said, that's not hard for me to do. And then I can ask you to actually scan and send me every agency agreement, right? I said, if we wanted to actually do it, right? This is not on camera. This is one-on-one. -on -one. And I said, I just know that at various times, you make a situational decision on fee based on the value of the property, based on the people, how you feel like you're going to work with these people, and whether you like it or not, Lutzi, there are certain listings that you want more than others, right? Absolutely. That's, yeah. life. That's life. It could be at, at any time you've got no listings and you need something, right? It could be that, you know, it's in an area or a price point that you're really trying to double down, or it could be the motivation of these people is so high um, that this thing's going to sell and you factor in your head, you know what, I'm going to lose 10, 15% of what I normally would have got on a fee or whatever it is. That's life. Frank, I'm going to hand over to you. Yeah, no worries. Well, we've got only a couple of minutes. So I, I have two questions, um, Andrew. Um, obviously, you, you've been in real estate a very long time and writing huge fees, uh, you know, this year and, and for many years. And, you know, as a business owner, I know the importance, obviously, one, you've got to be at your top of your game. But the reality is you need to have an incredible team around you to help you, you know, do what you do and, and, and stay and keep driving forward. What do you do in terms of your team, in terms of coaching, in terms of, you know, making sure that you have a core team of, uh, let's call them weapons? Yeah, yeah, good good question. Yeah, I mean, look, when you, when we talk numbers, and I know every agent gets a bit carried away with numbers, and, and they're all, look, numbers are great benchmarks as well, but, I mean, my numbers are, are really, I work with a brilliant team of, of um of two other salespeople you know, yep. as well. So they list and sell real estate. I've got a buyer agent and then I've got a marketing and a compliance agent yep. um, as well. So, uh, so we're a team of six and, and we wouldn't be able to do the volume that we write without obviously everyone working together. And I'd say um, we've got a very mature team. Um, so initially when I've, I've come through my career, I've had, you know, a team start a team of two, of course, and then three, four, you know, then back to three, then, you know, four five and then six. And I had a team at seven at one stage, um, which didn't work out very well. Um, but the, the amount of uh, where everyone is in their real estate experience also determines the level of coaching as well. Yes. Um, and, and depending on what lanes they're playing in. So, what we've designed is to making sure that everyone stays in their lane yeah. in the sense that I don't want, um, you know, myself or Ben or, or, or Sam who, who wear all the selling, we're bringing in the bacon. You know, that's our role is to actually list and sell property. So if we're out there doing marketing shoots and we're out there doing stuff that's actually not really dollar productive, then it's, it's kind of, it's a bit um, counterproductive for what we're meant to do with the team and the coaching centers around how we can how the people in those roles how the marketing manager of the team can be the best they can be at that so rather than doing an email that's 500 words why don't you pick up the phone and have a conversation there'd be a three-minute conversation so getting it more efficient yeah. you know, and rather than saying 50 words say five words being more direct you know so having a lot more coaching around how people are planning their day as well particularly for our buyer agent yeah you know, and a lot of time the buyer agent will their overflow and workload will be from what myself, Ben and Sam would be doing. Mm. And it's relying on us to generate that stuff. Whereas how do you coach someone to have the intuition to actually pick up the phone and, and make those calls independent of us, whatever we're doing. Um, and then there's the broader, of course, Cunningham's team, team yeah. coaching as well. You know, and a lot of people want to know how do you to do, how do you structure your week, time management, how do you get more time in a day, you know, and, and how do you, how do you, combat you know fee fee discounters and my selling marketing all those things are really relevant but to be honest a lot of that stuff is actually external coaching it's like working with people he's, like he's yourself. To tell you, frank andrew is a great i've seen him speak at conferences andrew for anyone that's watching here and when uh, covid restrictions lift and uh, it's it's a more freer for people to come and do training Andrew's a great guy to have speak um, at your conference or uh, your workshop. You know, he's a, you know, it's not, it's not a uh, Frank. It's not easy to get a real estate agent that's doing it to also explain it because most people that are that are so good at it are so good at it that they're on automatic pilot. They never really ever take time out to actually think, why the hell am I so good? You know, and um, it's one of the reasons why they actually find they struggle to get the greatest football players, the greatest tennis players 
to actually they they just they're 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 unconscious competent, you know. <laughs> they're so good. They don't, they don't know. They just say, "Mate, this is what I this is what I'm doing." But Lutz is very good at doing a bit of reflection and saying, "Mate, here's the reason why you do this," you know. Um, outstanding, Lutz here. This is outstanding, and um, you know this guy here is I call high tech, high touch, Frank. He he's still got the traditional methods. Yep. He draws he draws it on paper, you know, like a, like an architect does at a listing presentation. He draws, uses pen and paper, but he's also and the Cunningham's team have been very very good to be first move advantage on technology. They use digital pre list kits. They use a lot of the uh, technology involved with signing up contracts, you know, electronic signatures. And um, I remember when you were on the boat with us with Secure Exchange, you were extremely curious about finding out about the legalities and technology involving with uh, electronic uh, uh, signatures on contracts and when a thing is exchanged. So you're, you're sort of keeping an open mind, you know, for a guy that's been in real estate for a few decades, you're keeping an open mind on how technology is coming in and shaping the way that we communicate with vendors and buyers, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think, I think you know, you've always got to be open to, to and adapt to those new things as well. And there's always going to be some bright, nice, shiny new object that's going to come along that's going to take your focus. But I think for, especially for any salespeople who are listening in uh, that are running either running a team or not, it's it's remaining those fundamentals of, of, of where, where you're going to be in your flame rather than the wax work. You know, and that's for most of us, it's actually at the, at the dining room table. It's at, it's at the listing appointment. It's actually there. And I guess that's the topical... Uh, discussion we're having now is how do you be more competitive at the listing table how do you win more business you know and hopefully today you know give you some of those little tips and tricks that i work well for me but ultimately if you haven't sharpened your skills in the office you're going out there and you're pitching against someone who might be your biggest competitor and if they're a little bit more prepared or they've asked two or three more questions more than you then they're probably going to get their runs on the board before you and it's 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 frustrating how many listings I lose as well, where I thought I was in the box set. You said before, everything's going well on the listing appointment, but half the time, that's the oh shit moment where you think, God, this is going so well, but maybe they're like this with everyone. Mm. You know, and how do I, <laughs> and what do you do then? You're, right? you're, you're at the mercy of obviously their personality, but it's, um, it is, it's, it's very, very hard, but you've just got to obviously follow the process. Yeah. You know, and, and really, like you said, have that belief transfer and, and that's very hard to coach, but it, it's easy to do when you know your stuff, when you really, really do have that mastery around your product knowledge and your skills. And then you can just allow yourself to be you and that will, that authenticity will come across the table far easier. Love it. You know, that, you know, that brand new shiny object that's going to change the game. I've got good news. Oh yeah. It's here. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. I reckon, it's, it. I reckon it's the best piece of technology in the last 40 years. I, I'm, still, incredible. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still convinced the smartest thing you can ever do is that you get an email from someone and you read that email and then you quickly pick up the phone. As soon as that email has been sent, you pick yeah, up the chat. phone, notes fresh in their mind, and you quickly nip that in the bud and you answer that question there and bingo, absolute pleasure. Stay healthy. Frank, I'm going to see That's you right. on Friday at, 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 at your office. And uh, let's see, uh, yeah, keep it going. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, probably in about two, you know, I reckon in three months time, life is going to be dramatically different for people in the Northern beaches. Yeah. People are going to be out. The sun's going to be out. Today's a day that's giving us a bit of a taste, taste a test on what's about to come. We're going to be moving around. A lot of people are going to be vaccinated. Life is going to sort of uh, have moved. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Look awesome. <at> <laughs> thanks guys thanks for having me thanks tom thanks everybody bye See you guys